Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm uh, Paul Glastris, editor of the Washington Monthly Magazine. We're here at, uh, our, with our friends at New America for this uh, event, and we, uh, we uh, are grateful for your attendance. Um, <clears throat> we're here to talk about the, uh, the airline industry and, and a provocative story written for the Washington Monthly by uh, Philip Longman and uh, Lena Kahn. Uh, uh, Phil uh, and Lena are part of the uh, New America's Markets Enterprise and Resilience Initiative, uh, led by uh, Barry Lynn. They uh, promote political, industrial, economic, and uh, environmental resistance and document and clarify the dangers of extreme uh, consolidation on uh, the American uh, political uh, and uh, economics uh, scene. Now, <clears throat> Phil brought Phil and Barry brought me this story idea uh, about the decline of the American airline industry. And if you'd asked me ten years ago, uh, is airline deregulation a problem? I'd have thought, no. Like most people, um, uh, airline deregulation had served it seemed to serve my own interests well. I uh, my hometown is St. Louis, and I fly there. A uh, couple, three times a year, and ten years ago, you could jump on Southwest, uh, uh, you know, a week out, and get a hundred and twenty dollar round trip ticket and bag of peanuts and a nice seat, and it was quite comfortable. And uh, who was to argue with uh, airline deregulation? I was out in St. Louis a couple of weeks ago visiting my mother, and uh, uh, boy, you couldn't touch a Southwest airline ticket for under five hundred bucks. So I got a. Two weeks out, three weeks out, I got a four hundred plus dollar uh, U.S. Airways ticket, which really wasn't a U.S. Airways jet. It was a, something called Mesa Airways, and there was a one of these fifty seat uh, uh, jets where that you can't put your roller bag in the overhead compartment because they're too small. So everybody had to leave them at the jetway, and then all the way out, I had to change planes in Cincinnati. All the way out, there was a <coughs> big guy sitting next to me, not fat, just a big guy, mm -hmm. and he was ooching over into my seat with, you know, no uh, ability to do otherwise because of the narrowness of the seat. So I spent two and a half hours cricked over into the aisle like this. It was, uh, I, I mean, it was a, as bad a flight as I've had since the bad old days of Aeroflot. It was, uh, uh, so we've all kind of uh, seen this sort of degradation of the airline industry. And so Phil and uh, Barry and Lena came to us with the idea of writing a story, uh, which we're going to talk about now, about the role of airline deregulation and whether it served its purpose. Um, let me just introduce the panel here today. Um, uh, Phil Longman, uh, co-author of the story, is a senior fellow at the Washington Monthly and the New America Foundation. He's written extensively on transportation policy. He's also the author of, uh, I think, five books, including... Best Care Anywhere and The Empty Cradle, and has written for such publications as The Atlantic Monthly, Harvard Business Review, Wall Street Journal, New Republic, and The Washington Post. Uh, we're very pleased today to have former Congressman Jim Oberstar. Uh, uh, Congressman Oberstar served, uh, he's the longest serving member of Congress in Minnesota history, um, represented uh, Northeast Minnesota's 8th Congressional District. From 1975 to 2011, he was chairman uh, of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee from 2007 until 2011. Um, he is a major uh, voice on transportation policy in this country and a visiting scholar at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Also with us today is uh, Tom Jones. Uh, Tom is a columnist for Memphis Magazine and co-founder and main writer for the Smart City Memphis blog and a principal at Smart City Consulting. And finally, we have Josh Marks. He's the executive director of the American Aviation, uh, Aviation Institute, um, uh, which is uh, a part of, uh, works out of uh, George Washington University. Um, he was the senior director at MaxJet uh, Airways, uh, a, a startup airline, and uh, has been an aviation consultant and uh, is himself a private pilot. So we've got practitioners, policymakers, and uh, and uh, a couple of critics here. So uh, I just want to uh, start off by uh, 
asking Phil to come up and or to, to begin discussion. We just we don't, we want to do it here at the yeah. So Phil, I'd like you to you all have the article. Uh, I hope you've picked up a copy, but I'd I'd like Phil to do a little bit of a uh, summation of the argument of the evidence and so forth, and so that we have a a, a base to start from. Phil. Well, thank you, Paul. Um, we have an awful lot of expertise in this room, um, much of which goes way beyond mine, so I, I just want to say a very few words um, and hope leave a lot of room for discussion. But uh, the article, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, begins, I guess, with the premise that the American airline industry is failing um, from just about everybody's point of view. Um, certainly, it's failing from the point of view of shareholders of airlines. Um, this is an industry that's lost $50 billion collectively in the last 10 years um, in times when energy was expensive and times when energy has been cheap. Um, it doesn't matter. This industry has not been able to earn its cost of capital uh, over time. Um, obviously, we've seen just tremendous hardship and tragedy um, for the employees of airlines over the years. Um, and we all have stories like Paul shared, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more stories like that, of just the, the sheer indignity of travel, um, what, has, what it has become. Um, and most recently, um, we have this new trend that has really now um, assumed enough momentum that it's become very serious, which is that major cities, not just podunk cities, major places like Cincinnati and Memphis and St. Louis are now finding themselves um, cut off uh, from the global economy um, due to various mergers and machinations of the airline industry. Um, the, these cities now um, are seriously handicapped in their economic development because of their deteriorating air service. Um, this despite um, cities like Cincinnati being uh, headquarters of, of major um, corporations, Fortune 500 corporations like Procter & Gamble, right, or St. Louis uh, with Anheuser-Busch InBev, or Pittsburgh with all the green energy and uh, renewal that's been going on there. So our airline policy, or lack thereof, has in effect become more and more a kind of de, fa de facto industrial policy. Uh, whereby the fate of cities and regions rises and falls uh, according to how well uh, or how poorly um, the uh, airline industry uh, and its financiers um, deem to give it service. So um, that's the basic predicate of the piece. Uh, we spend a lot of time looking for um, inspiration um, from the long history of the United States in regulating railroads. And one might remember that uh, the first regulation of uh, basically any industry in the United States uh, came in 1887 uh, when the Interstate Commerce Commission was um, formed um, to deal with problems that are extremely analogous um, to what we have today. Um, we I think have been under the thrall of an idea that uh, deregulation has um, been uh, on net a positive in lowering fares. Um, I think that um, premise in itself needs scrutiny uh, because it appears that the actual rate at which fares have declined um, uh, was lower after deregulation than it, than it was declining before. Um, and so I hope we'll have a very rich discussion about all this. Um, again, our premise is only that we have a problem here now that can't be ignored, that needs to be fixed, that has risen now to the level of affecting the entire uh, course of economic development in the United States. And we just look forward to an earnest conversation. Thank you. Well, Phil, thank you, and, and uh, Lena, for your uh, excellent article, uh, <coughs> which I uh, downloaded. Very proud of myself. I'm able to use the iPhone, the iPad, and the MacBook Pro, and 
and, and, a, and, a, and a printer with an Ethernet cable. I didn't know any of those things existed until I left Congress and didn't have anyone do that for me. <laughs> I used to tell my staff who pleaded with me to learn the computer, I said, look, if I learn that, then who needs you? <laughs> they said, okay, just no, don't, don't, don't worry about it. But uh, th this is really a, a splendid uh, piece and, and well uh, thought through, well researched. <clears throat> In 1986, eight years after deregulation, there was a conference of airport managers, the uh, Association of Airport Executives and the, uh, what's called today the Air Airports Council International, ACI, in Minneapolis. During the conference, one of the principal speakers said, the problem with the aviation business today is we've got too many airlines. What this industry and our uh, airports association need is a few bankruptcies. Well, they've had their few bankruptcies. In fact, a lot of them. In 1978, I sat uh, on, on the uh, dais at uh, committee uh, markup, full committee markup for the Aviation Deregulation Act. And it really troubled me, bothered me a great deal. How are small towns going to be served in, in an era where we don't have anybody standing between the airline and the airline traveler? Uh, no one looking out for the interest of cities rather than uh, the uh, airlines looking out for their own interest. And I offered an amendment uh, to uh, uh, hold in uh, service uh, where that existed at the time and to provide a mechanism for funding a service to small communities known as essential air service. That was my language, I picked it out of, out of the blue. And then wrapping up my statement, I said, Mr. Chairman, if this amendment isn't passed, uh, in the era of deregulation, there will be towns like some in my district that are so remote that without air service, the only way to get there is to be born there. <laughs> and I don't know where that idea came from, but, but it just popped into my head. I said it, the place uh, erupted into uh, laughter. The chair put the question, and it passed. I'd have never voted for it if it hadn't. Even that is under attack today, essential air service, serving small communities. Uh, in the first five years after deregulation, there are 22 new entrants into airline competition. But eight years later, only five of those were left, and by 1990, only one survived, and I used to put this question at audiences, this is too risky to do it because you know too much about the subject matter, but I'll give you a frequent flyer miles if you can tell me which was that surviving carrier. Yeah, everybody says Southwest, it was America West, and now they're gone. Uh, in those first 20 years after deregulation, uh, air travelers were saving on average six and a half billion dollars a year in airfares compared to pre-deregulation era. But I think, uh, as Phil just uh, suggested, uh, the savings are in question today and, and the subject needs to be revisited. <clears throat> what happened in aviation was unforeseen uh, after deregulation. Nobody was talking about a hub-and-spoke aviation system and the sort of consolidation and the, and the, and the, uh, the there's a great French term, bouleversement, you know, a real uh, upheaval in the industry uh, in which uh, the uh, policy had been to aggregate customers and, f and channel them into the overseas carriers, TWA, Pan Am, Eastern, who had long-haul service northwest to the Pacific Rim. And uh, after deregulation, nobody predicted that uh, the domestic carriers with the strong feed would, would overtake the international carriers because they hadn't, those international carriers hadn't developed a domestic feed. And, uh, and, and that became the driving force for United 
to eventually acquire Pan Am service from Seattle to Tokyo and, uh, and others to, to acquire uh, routes, in, including, um, well, the disaster that, uh, that, Phil, you mentioned your hometown of St. Louis, when, uh, when Carl Icahn bought uh, TWA and sold off their computer reservation system, made $300 million overnight, and sold off their nonstop uh, route from St. Louis to Heathrow, London, to American Airlines for a billion dollars, which, uh, I'm sorry, $400 million, and American made it back in one year, uh, over a billion dollars in revenue in one year off that uh, f flight, which they transferred from St. Louis to O'Hare. So now here you have St. Louis, which was, was a thriving island of aviation service and now becomes uh, a parched desert. And this consolidation has continued, and it's very much like what happened with the Postal Service uh, and, the, and the railroads in the 1960s. The railroads just hated uh, having passenger service uh, and, and more than that, having the railway post office because it was the RPO that was providing the margin of profit that the, the railroads had to continue service because the ICC would not al allow them to discontinue a profitable line. So the Postal Service got this great idea of, uh, of taking mail that had, had gone from Chisholm to Buell five miles, work the mail, drop it off, pick up the bag, drop, and, and then go all the way to Duluth, 80, uh, 90 miles to Duluth. No, no, we're going to take all the mail from Chisholm, Buell, uh, Eveleth, Virginia, Cotton, and so on, to Duluth, sort it, and then <coughs> drive it 90 miles back. So this letter is going to take a 180-mile round trip. Now, and somehow that was going to make good economic sense. Well, the airlines did the same thing. And, and the, but the railroads conspired with the post office to take the RPO off so they could apply for a discontinuance and shut down uh, less than carload service, LCL service, as, as well as passenger service, and convert to uh, all freight. Well, the airlines are following that, that, have been following that same model over all the intervening years and consolidating and coming together. Uh, with the result that uh, I, uh, when I chaired the Aviation Subcommittee and the Investigations and Oversight and chair the full committee, vigorously opposed these mergers. You know, the code sharing started as a benign proposition. Uh, we'll give you seamless service. <clears throat> and um, I was uh, home cleaning out some, some uh, drawers, found my father's log uh, in uh, 1966 or so. He traveled out to Washington to visit us. And uh, he traveled uh, Chisholm to Minneapolis by bus. Minneapolis, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, <coughs> Cleveland, Washington by air. You don't have to do that anymore. You don't make all those intermediary stops. Uh, and, <coughs> uh, and that was a great benefit of, of deregulation and, and, <coughs> and of code sharing where you uh, board one carrier and they'll transfer you to another, but your luggage goes seamlessly, you go seamlessly. Then they transferred that model to the international arena. <clears throat> and Northwest arranged a, a, a code share with Air France, first with KLM, then with Air France, then with Alitalia. <clears throat> and, and the next move was to get antitrust immunity to have their code sharing protected from the antitrust laws and from, uh, uh, from, from the, the adverse uh, results of, of that kind of, of collusion. And with the result that Northwest and, and KLM uh, for a time competed, but once the antitrust immunity was in place, they don't compete on, on fair any longer. And and, and you had uh, <clears throat> then the acquisition of Northwest by Delta and an immunized alliance 
And the next one that came along was United with Continental. And uh, at, I thought we had a chance of stopping that before uh, the uh, end of, of 2008. But uh, <clears throat> the Bush Justice Department moved ahead to uh, uh, prove it. They never met a merger they couldn't like. And, uh, and I said, now you're going to have th three global carriers. You have two now. You'll have three. And they will rule the world. And with the moves by um, uh, U.S. Airways and American uh, Airlines, uh, I, I, we're, we're coming ever closer to that reality. The European Economic Community in uh, January opened an inquiry into the antitrust immunity uh, status of, of, uh, of uh, 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 United uh, Continental Delta, Northwest, KLM, Air France, Alitalia, uh, Czech, uh, China Eastern, no, it's China, uh, uh, China Southern Airlines, and, and, and now you have the, the third global mega carrier poised to control the world market. They will not compete on price. You will see price following. And in fact, that's what we have, have observed. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the future of, of aviation um, is uh, at a perilous time. I think this is the most perilous moment for aviation since 1958 when President Eisenhower uh, supported the, the creation of, of the modern FAA from the old Civil Aeronautics uh, Authority. <coughs> And, uh, and, and, and began the process of investing in uh, uh, the airport uh, construction program uh, and modernizing our air traffic control system. That all goes back to 1958. <clears throat> but uh, we're, we're now in a stall. And I think, uh, I think the future for air travel is extremely perilous. pull this off because it's better than speaking directly into a mic. Um, so I'm the executive director of the American Aviation Institute, AAI, and obvious disclaimers right out of the gate, uh, we do tend to take uh, market-oriented uh, stances when it comes to regulatory issues. Uh, I spend a fair amount of my time examining current policy issues uh, with the team at AAI, looking at uh, foreign ownership, looking at alliances uh, and other uh, policy actions taken in the past 10 years that may or may not have accomplished uh, the original consumer intent but have obvious implications for airline profitability and route viability. Uh, so I come at this from a, a, a different angle uh, from many people uh, and I, I do think that one thing we can all agree on is that as we head into a period of profound change in the industry, uh, I don't think there's any question uh, for reasons that we'll talk about that the next five years are going to be critical for the industry. It is, it is absolutely imperative to have a national dialogue on these issues and to develop at least some level of consensus, if not an official aviation policy, that defines the, the perspective of both the American government and the consumer towards airline service. Uh, defining what we mean by accessibility of air service, affordability of air service, the degree of antitrust protection that should be awarded uh, both in a global context and domestically in the United States. Uh, these are all important things to discuss, and while we may all have different perspectives on the issue, the only way to advance the conversation is to consider those, those independent perspectives. So taking a step back, I, my background, is, as uh, we touched on, is, is as a practitioner in the airline business. Uh, I've started an airline. I've worked with major carriers on route planning, revenue decisions. Uh, I have spent many, many, many days, weeks, months, working with carriers to identify the, the hidden gems of market opportunities that exist around the United States. And, you know, when, when we hear stories about airports like Cincinnati or Memphis, uh, where a legacy carrier that has consolidated is hanging on by a thread for political reasons, um, the obvious question that we ask ourselves is, well, why on earth hasn't somebody else moved in? Uh, I don't think there's any question when you look at a market like Cincinnati or Memphis that there is high yield business traffic in that market. Selecting carefully the routes that you fly should result in economic benefits for the airline serving it and for the community. 
But the question remains, well, why hasn't it happened yet? It's not like Delta is going to go to the mat in Cincinnati if a startup comes in and offers to take over the service. They're going to hand the keys over. Here you go. It's all yours. You, know, you wanted it. We're, we're out of here. We're, we're consolidating at our existing hubs. It hasn't happened. Why isn't Southwest in that market? Right? And I, I think it's too simplistic to say, well, it's, it's not a Southwest market, or they have existing service to Columbus or, or other markets in the area. The, the fundamental realities are that we, we see a divergence in today's market between airlines that serve business traffic and airlines that serve leisure traffic. Now, it used to be 10 years ago, you can even see it in how, how JetBlue started, uh, that the, the differences between business and leisure traffic were much narrower than they are today. Um, and one of the things that, that we've seen with international consolidation through antitrust uh, immunity, through the development of, of broad networks that encompass multiple countries, uh, the resulting focus on sales contracts with Fortune 500 companies, is that airlines have reoriented, reoriented themselves to try to, to be the most attractive entities possible for business travelers. Now what that's meant is that there's been an enormous reshuffling of the deck across the industry. Uh, to start with the, the anecdotal stories about uh, Southwest Airlines and their pricing, even Southwest has moved towards more of a business-oriented model uh, it, with higher fare classes, uh, preferred uh, boarding, and, and other amenities that they use to target higher-end travelers. Well, what's happened to you know, the ordinary uh, price-sensitive leisure traveler? How does that person uh, afford or get access to the national air system? There are airlines out there that serve that market and do it quite successfully. You love to hate them because they're called Spirit and Allegiant, uh, and they will nickel and dime you to death uh, after you buy a $9 fare. And for whatever you say about it, they have been very, very successful at that business model. Because even when you pay the additional $35 to carry your bag on the airplane and $10 to get a seat and $5 to go to the lavatory, you're still paying a third of what you would have paid on Delta or, or United. Right? And so they've been able to carve out a market, and those carriers are growing very, very quickly. Uh, same thing you can see with Frontier, which is reorienting itself in that direction. So I think over time, what you will see is a, a, uh, a filling in the gaps of route networks in the United States. I'm, I'm not convinced by any means that there needs to be government intervention in order to solve the problem of why Cincinnati quite obviously has a, a gap between service demand and service supply. The question really for, for us at, at AAI in thinking about national aviation policy is what should the government be doing? Should the government be trying to standardize air product? Uh, should the government embrace the diversity of product that you see with airlines like Spirit uh, who have found a way to, to target price sensitive customers and give accessible air service? Or should they do what they have been doing over the past two years, which is directly attempting to intervene and to standardize air product and, and restrict the ability of airlines like Spirit to innovate with what we all would think are somewhat wacky pricing policies. Um, there are some fundamental policy decisions that have to get made there that I think go hand in hand with the broader perspective issues of should we be giving antitrust immunity? Should we be, be pursuing open market strategies across the board? Should the government be getting uh, involved in depth in, in uh, slot allocation decisions at congested airports and favoring explicitly low fare carriers for entry into, into competitive hubs? I, I think all those questions go together. Um, I think to, to, to finish off my comments, I, I started with the premise that the next five years are, are absolutely critical uh, for the industry. Uh, the reasons that, that I think they're critical are the following. Uh, number one, as, as uh, we have talked about, the consolidation genie is out of the bottle at this point. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult now that you have carriers like Delta and United that have demonstrated the pricing power that results from global networks and from uh, concentration of routes to try to discourage additional mergers. Uh, we're seeing it today with American and US Airways. Uh, they will continue. Uh, I, I have no doubt that airlines like JetBlue, Alaska, Hawaiian are all going to be in play at some point soon, simply because they, they do what they do very well, but they are still fundamentally regional airlines. Uh, and to compete, I think, for the business traffic that's so critical in an elevated fuel environment, you need a different business model. The second issue is small community air service, and, and I see this as, as a, a, a two-part problem. The first part is that the technology of how we serve small communities is changing. 50-seat um, regional jets are economically obsolete. Uh, they do not work in a high fuel environment uh, to move people at, at airfares that they can afford to pay. More fundamentally, we have significant changes legislated now uh, that change the standards that are required for pilots 
and the duty hours that they can fly, which will result in significant changes in pilot supply over the next three years. So even if you had the airplanes that were economically efficient, I think there's still a, a big question as to whether there are going to be enough pilots to actually fly them into the small communities. The third piece of the puzzle, though, is uh, intermodal options and alternatives. Um, when you look at markets like Cincinnati, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, traffic from Cincinnati to Chicago today uh, is roughly half the level in terms of local traffic that it was eight years ago. Half the level. Um, the half that remained are the higher fare passengers, uh, which the airlines can afford to fly. Well, what happened to everybody else? Are they still going from Cincinnati to Chicago? Yes. How are they going? It's called Megabus. It's called the other bus services that have stepped in as well and are offering uh, one-stop or non-stop bus connections from point A to point B. Now, there are also connecting hub options and other ways to get there. But I think it, it's too simplistic to treat aviation policy in isolation. If you're going to think about national aviation policy, you have to also think about routes that the airlines may, may not be uh, economically able to fly and what other options consumers may have in order to get from point A to point B. If you're dealing with essential air service markets where there may not be an alternative, that's a completely different picture in my mind from service from Washington to Boston, say, or Cincinnati to Chicago, where there's a thriving bus service and other alternatives that can exist. I think all those pieces have to go into the discussion as well. Thank you. First, I want to thank uh, Phil and Lena and the Washington Monthly for giving voice to more of than a million people in Memphis who are often told how lucky we are to be paying some of the highest fares for a hub in the United States. The thing is, I don't think our leaders in Memphis are unconcerned or unaware of the problem, but there's a tendency to justify the fares because they feel powerless when it comes to knowing what to do and often feel like if they identify the problem, they're then going to be held accountable for solving the problem. At the same time, economic development officials in Memphis seem scared to say anything that would make our primary carrier upset, the logic being that if the airline is cutting 25% of our flights after telling us that it loves us, what could it possibly do if it decided to reject us? Memphis and the other cities that are in the Washington Monthly article uh, are, like, are like the frog sitting in a pot of water that gets hotter and hotter until the frog is boiled to death. The impact from the high fares comes slowly, and as a result, we accept a decrease in service and adapt. Uh, we come to grips with an increase in fares, and we adjust. And in this way, the impacts are often defined more personal than economic, although every person in our region has a horror story about airfares. There are the stories about the thousands of us who have driven 120 miles to Little Rock, or even 210 miles to Nashville to save several hundred dollars. And although even sometimes when we drive to Little Rock, we board a Delta flight that takes us back to Memphis and then our final destination. There's the $750 ticket that I bought recently to go to Cincinnati with 10 days notice. There's my friend who takes the overnight discount mega bus from Chicago to Memphis because it's too expensive to fly in. There's the $900 ticket to Austin for a Memphis law firm that regularly works there and is finding itself hard to be able to make that sense of that. There's the small business that wanted to consolidate its operations to Memphis but decided against it because it couldn't make the airfare make sense budgetarily. There's the national music organization that relocated from Memphis because it was too expensive for its members to fly in for the annual conference. There's the consultant for local government that had to renegotiate his contract because he had no idea that the airfares flying it out of Memphis were going to be twice what he expected. And then we even have our mayor who uh, drove eight-hour round trip to St. Louis for a 90-minute meeting rather than pay $976 for a 75-minute flight. These are the kind of stories that are rampant in Memphis, and they create such a disconnect between people working on economic development and the people they're serving. At the time of the Northwest and Delta Airlines merger, the Tennessee Commissioner of Economic Community Development told us that the value of the merger 
would bring Memphis's economy into the 21st century and was well worth whatever price we had to pay for it. The headline that day was, Northwest Delta merger, good for Tennessee. The next day, on the front page of the same newspaper, the headline was, airline merger may be trouble for Pinnacle Airlines. That's our regional jet. Then Delta's CEO reassured us at a special breakfast meeting that all would remain well in Memphis and we were vital to the strategy of Delta. Unfortunately, he gave the exact same speech in Cincinnati. And so over and over, we've, we've been given a steady diet of spin when serious scenario thinking would have served us better. Delta's 25% cut in flights, its discontinuing of a year-round direct flight to Amsterdam took place while the federal government was building a $72 million air traffic tower and while our airport authority was building a parking garage and passenger transfer facility that cost even more. Except for the few hours when Delta flights are landing and departing, the airport in Memphis is eerily quiet, despite more than a decade of talks that Northwest was imminent to move into Memphis. The old axiom still remains true. If you die in Memphis and go to heaven, you have to go through Atlanta. <laughs> mayor Wharton, the mayor of Memphis, has said, the whole world is about co competition and we've got to find a way to be more competitive. I can't relocate my headquarters, but the business community can, as we are seeing. But to pay a high fare and have to go through Atlanta is, is kicking a man when it's down. This even seems to violate the Eighth Amendment against cruel and unusual punishment. There's little optimism in Memphis that things are going to get better, and it's worth remembering that some of the, the highest fares for a hub in the United States is taking place in a region with, with some of the lowest median household incomes in the country. In the uh, first decade of this century, it wasn't any surprise to any of us in Memphis that our economy was struggling. We lost 50,000 jobs. We've been beaten hard by the global recessions like some of the other cities mentioned in the article. And the mergers of companies are taking more and more decision making outside of our borders. <coughs> our economy still remains fragile in Memphis and a lot of things have to be done right for us to improve our trajectory high airfares or ice on our wings at the exact time that we need our economy to take off. It unlevels the playing field at the exact time that we need all of our opportunities to align for new jobs and economic growth. The repercussions to our economy are pervasive. If I have employees in Memphis, it's too expensive and now inconvenient to fly them anywhere. If I'm a supplier in Memphis, it's too expensive to see my customers unless I can drive to them. If I'm a professional, it's too expensive to connect with a peer group in other cities. If I'm a young entrepreneur or young professional, it's an expensive place to consider living and working. In other words, at the exact time that every city needs to connect easily and freely with the rest of the world, we have a major obstacle. And the greatest irony of all is that in the city where FedEx invented modern global commerce, our citizens are being priced out of participation in the global and even the national market because of airfares. Uh, I'll end with this uh, email I got from a, a colleague of mine recently when the, our conversation turned to her working out of Memphis. She lives in Chicago. And she said, I can commute to New York from Chicago cheaper than I can fly out of Memphis. It's such a cheap and easy flight from Chicago to New York. Think how much bigger my potential pool of employees, colleagues, clients is than if I lived in Memphis or if I were confined to Chicago. Already I'm advantaged in being in Chicago. The market is much larger than Memphis. There are more people to buy from, sell from, learn from, collaborate with. Now add New York to my market. Then compare that to Memphis. It's terribly unfair and it's getting more unfair every day. Well, thank you all. That's some very, uh, very powerful stuff. Um, 
I want to open up the discussion uh, first uh, uh, among us, and then and then with with those here. We have a just looking at the guest list, a lot of uh, uh, of very smart and knowledgeable people about the industry, and so I want to bring you into the conversation. Um, but let me begin by asking a question that I think was asked by one of the commenters on our website uh, on the story, the original story. And it, 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 it's not a question that I necessarily agree with, but it's an obvious one from a more libertarian or free market perspective. And, and, and it goes something like this. Okay, so cities like Memphis or St. Louis are taking it on the chin, and we want to assure that they have, if, if in fact you buy into the notion that there's a political and governmental uh, uh, imperative or mandate that uh, we ought to make sure that cities like Memphis or St. Louis have uh, reasonably priced uh, and frequent and uh, 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 useful air service, uh, wouldn't it be better to just pay subsidies to airlines uh, to run those routes rather than, as is suggested in Phil and Lena's article, uh, re-regulate the whole of the airline industry in some way to make sure that there's some kind of cross-subsidization such that uh, those of us who fly from Washington to L.A. Uh, cheaper than can one can fly from Memphis to Chicago, uh, our fares go up a little bit uh, under a, a regulated uh, system. Uh, so w that, that mm -hmm. Phil, was, was kind of implicit in your story. Why not just have the federal government pay to lo have lower fares from Memphis to Chicago? Well, I, I think there are instances, as in the legislation that you passed, where it, it makes sense to ask ourselves um, for some little town up in the Iron Range, um, should we have a subsidy or not? Make it explicit. We can all balance our budget and take that into account. But uh, subsidizing cities of the magnitude of Cincinnati or Pittsburgh, I think, is a completely different order. I would suggest, just as a thought experiment, you know, uh, to revisit uh, where we've been here before, right? In the, in the 19th century, railroads emerged as the dominant transportation form uh, in a completely unregulated <laughs> way. Uh, it led to a explosion of of, 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 of new players in construction, people pushing railroads to every corner, corner of the continent, um, to the point by 1870s, a third of the rail industry was in um, bankruptcy. Um, this is kind of analogous to what we saw in airlines in the 1980s. Lots of new players building parallel lines, not enough to get too bad. Um, so even, but even as the airline, or railroads in this case, were not thriving, um, they controlled local monopolies, right? And uh, thoughtful people began to notice that whether Cincinnati grew, or Memphis grew, or Chicago grew, or Pittsburgh grew, had everything to do with what the freight rates and passenger rates were on the railroads, and those in turn were being determined by people like Jay Gould and other financiers who were watering railroad stock. And it, we found ourselves in a world where uh, a man's enterprise, a city's comparative advantages, um, weren't being taken into account. It was rather the machinations of Wall Street that were determining what railroads went where and what they charge. And so as early as 1887, right, we, we came to a conclusion as a country that this shall not stand. And it wasn't that we would say, oh, we're going to get into the business of picking winners and losers in the economy. We said, we're not going to let financiers in the machinations of Wall Street pick winners and losers. Now, what that meant in effect was that we had a system that um, equalized the prices um, between short haul and long haul and between various different regions. Now, there are some things just about the basic physics of both railroads and airlines 
that we're up against. In the case of airlines, it takes a tremendous amount of energy just to get the plane in the air, right? Mm -hmm. So if it lands 45 minutes later, right, um, it has consumed 90% as much fuel as if it lands three hours later or something like that, right? So short hauls are always going to be much more expensive than long hauls. Also, there are tremendous economies of scale in the airline industry. So, you know, whether you have an airport that has one plane with five people coming every day or 500 planes with 200 people each on each, you still have to have a tower, you still have to have baggage facilities, you still have to all have all of this, right? So the market will always begin to favor uh, the high density routes, which is also what happened in railroads, right? So that's why you can fly from here to San Francisco for half what it costs to fly from here to Pittsburgh, right? It's because the density, the economies of scale, and, and the fact that the short haul actually does physically um, create as much cost, almost as much cost as, as so now you're going to say, well, you're going to just let live in that world as we find it, just go on like this? Um, I think not. I mean, it's certainly not the American tradition. Um, every Another key point to remember about this is airlines are, like railroads, like telephones, um, like the internet, networked entities. So the more places they go and the more people have access to them, the greater their utility, right? So um, that's why um, from the very beginning, people understood when telegraphs and telephones came along that they would require some cross subsidy to the outer reaches um, in order to um, be economically viable. I think the larger picture of what we're seeing here is the logic of the market now is, is forcing the airlines to go after the business traveler, to go after the trunk line, long distance thing. And as they do, and, 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 and the rest of the world gets cut off from this network, the value of the network itself goes down, just as if there were fewer and fewer places that you could call on the telephone. Um, so it seems to me more than appropriate that we have a public policy um, that looks to equalize these prices. It doesn't mean we have to go back to some of the absurdities that exist under the Civil Aeronautics Board of you know, micromanaging every little detail. But time to have a discussion. I, I, would, I would love to hear the thoughts of the rest of the panel on, on Phil's point. Well, uh, Phil uh, painted a very uh, broad picture and a, and a very good one and, and well, well said uh, about the uh, economies of scale. Uh, you know, a short haul service that is under, under uh, two hours uh, generates on average uh, seven thousand, uh, nine thousand dollars net profit, whereas long haul service transcontinental, transatlantic, is in the range of two hundred fifty thousand dollars net profit. Uh, so it does make better sense. Of the, uh, but 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 there is another context in which we ought to be considering the whether it would be good to pay subsidies or better to pay subsidies to operate these short haul routes. If you come down on the, uh, on the yes answer to that question, then you're simply going back to the days of the Civil Aeronautics Board and, and, and a whole uh, a range of calculations that have to be made to determine how much, for what service, for what uh, uh, gauge of aircraft, what time of day, and, and a whole range of issues that bring you right back into the regulated era. Uh, the only uh, uh, era, uh, the only uh, sector of transportation that really did what deregulation intended was trucking. We had a million trucks at the outset of the interstate era 1956 on America's roads. Today we have seven million. Trucking deregulation in 1979 or so uh, really resulted in an explosion of competition. Uh, in, in railroads, we had 60 class, 60 railroads, not all of them class ones, but they're all competing in 1980. Deregulation is supposed to get the government out of determining market entry and pricing and, and that the Justice Department would uh, prevent uh, uh, collusion, combination, and consolidation of the industry. Today we have four we have two duopolies, four major class one railroads, two east and two west of the Mississippi. That's not direct head-to-head -head competition. 
And that's this, that is what is happening now in aviation. If, if the next step goes, to, goes through with the U.S. and uh, uh, American. So uh, the, the context should be, what is the public interest? What is the public role? In 1787, the Congress uh, passed the, uh, the Continental Congress passed the Northwest Ordinance, which in, 1980, in 1789 was incorporated into uh, uh, law of the of the new uh, United States by the first Congress as the free waterways policy. That the waterways are the common heritage of all Americans. The airways are the common heritage of all Americans. No one owns that airspace. You have a privilege to, to fly in it and to use it. And in that context, then, what is the public interest? And the public interest in, in, in uh, aviation deregulation was that we'd have competition. That, uh, as uh, Mr. Marx said uh, a little uh, while ago, uh, uh, should, should, we, uh, uh, sh should there be a government um, uh, intervention in the marketplace to equalize competition. Well, that should have happened at the outset, not in, not in the aftermath of the mergers. The DOT has, has uh, one part of that regulatory authority, and justice has the other. Justice has antitrust, which is a very blunt instrument, very difficult to, uh, uh, to uh, implement whereas DOT can consider a much wider range of, of factors in determining whether a merger uh, would, or an acquisition, would be in the best public interest. And we still have the public interest in the air service, and uh, determining the answer to that question, whether to pay subsidies, is a valuable and useful debate that we ought to engage in in this country. Well, I, I think... As you say, there, there's a question about whether there should be intervention. And, and the first step in that process is to define the criteria on which the American consumers uh, prioritize what's important to them. Right. Uh, part of our frustration at, at AAI is that there hasn't been a, a defined playbook or a set of criteria that have been uniformly applied by DOT, even under the current administration. They flip-flopped on a number of these issues. They simply exactly. can't decide whether they're free market or interventionist. And that's what's paralyzing for the industry, because you don't know what game you're playing. I think w with respect to, to the, the needs of small hub airports, small communities, clearly we have a, a different set of issues at play. Large, large metropolitan areas like Washington, New York, San Francisco, Chicago will always have the economic strength to be a competitive environment. When it comes to small hubs, I, I posit as follows. You can choose between diversity of service and diversity of fares, but it's very, very difficult to get both at the same time because you're dealing with very different economic models uh, when you choose uh, to, to have diversity of service and a lot of nonstop routes in a, a relatively small market. To accomplish that, as we saw in Cincinnati, or we see in Memphis, uh, it involves a lot of regional jets, uh, smaller aircraft that are flying a smaller number of people to diverse destinations, giving them the convenience of nonstop service, but with higher airfares to pay for it. In contrast uh, with markets like Cincinnati, and this has developed over time as, as Delta has scaled the hub down, uh, there are alternatives that are lower fare. And the, the, the cost of a lower airfare is a connecting flight itinerary, right? Y you, mm -hmm. you put up with a longer travel time to get from point A to point B because you value money more than you value time, right? And so I think this is, this is the fundamental decision point that, that we all have to think about which is in these, in these compromised markets where there is a base of business traffic, there is wealth to be served, there is a demand for air travel. The airlines today are not well equipped to play this middle ground of both diverse service and affordable fares. Uh, they will look at these markets as opportunities if they can, if they can tap that business traffic and charge a, a, an appropriate fare. But the moment that they see that they can't do that and that aircraft are better, more, more profitably deployed, uh, from a shareholder perspective, in major hub markets, it's natural to expect that the airlines are going to move the, the service out. So, you know, I think that, that when you talk about or, uh, cities like Memphis, you can't complain at the same time about length of travel and airfares or, or you know, the, the fact that nonstop routes that used to be available a couple of years ago, uh, you know, aren't available today. When you look at Cincinnati, you know, Cincinnati was never 
a low-cost air environment. It was always one of the prime places where Delta screwed people in terms of airfares because they could. Because they could, right? It was, it was a market with a very high willingness to pay. And Delta was able to then base a hub there. They made up for the traffic gap, the fact there weren't a lot, a lot of leisure passengers in that market by connecting people from New York to LA and filling airplanes from Minneapolis to Atlanta. And that's how they made that hub work. The difference now is that markets like Detroit have better business bases to work from. So if you're going to connect traffic, it's more profitable for the airlines to do it in a market like Detroit than it is to do it in a market like Cincinnati. Those are the fundamental questions that need to be debated. Is there a need for policy intervention uh, when airlines make those kinds of profit-driven moves, or is this simply a fact of life for these, these small hub communities? Can, can I just uh, quickly say, it, it seems to me, sorry to in, interject here, but we talk about the airline market, but this is an airline market, and Phil's piece makes does an accounting here in, in which we as taxpayers are paying an enormous amount of money to allow the market to function. Give me an example of that. Airports. Uh, you pay a PFC, which goes to the airport under a federally administered program. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, the bailout of, of, of pension funds as, as, as airlines go bankrupt, right? We're paying right. for that. For a certain number of airlines, correct? Yeah. So, so you know, all of the all of the R and D that went in originally to airline uh, to airline uh, technology, um, the FAA. Uh, so, so, so it, it's not as if you, you, the way you ask the question is: Is it, fa it, it that a, someone living in Cincinnati or Memphis um, uh, ought to accept? Um, <coughs> that because of their location in a major metropolitan area that happens not to be one of the top eight, that they have to choose between uh, cost and frequency, I think was the, d the distinction. Um, why, I guess, is the answer, is the, is the question, why should we ask, we don't ask Americans who live in Memphis to choose uh, between uh, cell phones that can reach everyone in the United States or cell phones that cost three or four times as much as somebody's cell phone in San Francisco. So it just, it just, it's a, it's a, for the average person, I think they would wonder why they have to make that choice. Okay, well, let's, let's break those issues apart. Um, I think, first of all, you can take issues like the, the, you know, roughly $3 billion of cost that went into the 9-11 bailout and say this is a special situation. Uh, you know, probably all of us would have done that differently if we had tried to do something in more than a couple of days of deliberation. Right, that was a, a unique situation. Uh, when it comes to federal infrastructure funding for, for uh, aviation, um, I, I agree with the point that the costs of the National Air Service system uh, are borne by all travelers in all markets. Okay, the way that, that it works today in terms of uh, ticket level taxes and segment taxes uh, does roughly allocate the cost of that infrastructure on the routes that people fly. So New York passengers are paying a disproportionate share relative to Cincinnati passengers. I don't think you can make the case that there's an inequity between what people in Cincinnati have paid in versus what people in New York have paid in. I don't think that works when you actually distill it down. And we put out a report last year uh, that went into a, a very significant amount of depth on this. But I do think you can say, um, you know, from, from the perspective of somebody in Cincinnati, uh, should they have to make a choice, right? And, I, you know, I, I, again, default to the market position on this in that if, in fact, there were demand in Cincinnati for uh, lower cost air travel at volumes that could fill a flight to Orlando or to Fort Lauderdale, Southwest would be in that market. That's what they do, right? But the fact of the matter is Cincinnati, uh, to some extent like Austin, is an odd duck because it is a business market without that corresponding leisure demand in, in quantities that, that an airline can make viable. Um, and so, you know, for every Cincinnati where you have that, that, that uh, divergence of, of traffic, I can also point to markets like Austin, for example, that have both business traffic and leisure traffic, they're non-hub markets, that have seen a, a significant growth in air service, uh, but not because of hub consolidation, because there was an opportunity to be served. Um, I think, you know, if, if and, and uh, you know, I'm not an airport guy, um, but I do think that, that some of the issues that we're seeing with markets like Cincinnati uh, and Memphis do also come down to the local community in that they have not figured out 
how to articulate the demand that they have for lower cost air travel to low fare carriers that could come in and serve the void. Or they are, are so focused on uh, the breadth of, of nonstop service in terms of air service development in those communities that they don't look at alternatives from carriers that might come in and, and wouldn't play to the frequent flyer base in the city, you know, wouldn't play to the corporate contracts that are already in place. Uh, the, the classic example, I think, of this uh, in, the, in the past decade has been Skybus. You know, Skybus was an airline born out of a local community's need for lower cost air travel. Um, Skybus spent tens of millions of dollars building infrastructure, buying airplanes to serve the Columbus market uh, and, and connect them to points around the United States. Uh, I think the airline lasted three months because, again, given, you know, when push came to shove with the local community, uh, the narcotic of frequent flyer points, uh, the ease of traveling over some of these other competitive hubs was irresistible, and they, they wouldn't look at, at alternatives. These are market forces at play, and I think that, that uh, you know, it's important to consider those perspectives and not just think about, well, we paid an X to the infrastructure, so we should have a right to a corresponding X of service. But, but that, uh, uh, that uh, thought process mm -hmm. ignores the reality of the, of the marketplace of the concentrated hubs, mm -hmm. where the, uh, <clears throat> just take the example of Minneapolis-St. Paul, mm -hmm. uh, before the Delta acquisition of Northwest, uh, it was a concentrated hub. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, in the terms of the industry, a fortress hub. Uh, Northwest fought tooth and nail to prevent United Airlines from getting one gate at MSP. One gate, gate 33 was, was the battle cry. Uh, well, why? Because they didn't want United to have a foothold foot in Minneapolis-St. Paul. They didn't want the competition. You know, look, all these, all these big airline guys, they, uh, they, they, they just, they just, they want competition. They want themselves to be the competitor and no one else. And uh, it's the public interest to ensure that we don't have bigness, that there is action taken by the Department of Transportation, the Justice Department, and those fortress hubs to, to prevent the squeezing out of competition. You had the case of Spirit Airlines in the uh, 19, late 1980s, 88, 89, which started service from uh, Boston to Detroit, uh, uh, three flights a day, at half the fares of Northwest. <laughs> Northwest doubled its service mm -hmm. uh, from Detroit to Boston, dropped their fares, and provided beyonds and additional frequent flyer miles. And with the power of their Detroit hub, they were able, within uh, six months, to drive spirit out of the marketplace. And then the fares went up, $8 higher than they were prior to the competition. And, you know, there, there is... <laughs> That's the power of the hub. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the, the role of government was to ensure that there was equity in the, in the competition. And government failed. It did not do its job. And Frank Mulvey, uh, who served uh, in, in the Inspector General's office at DOT, served in the General Accounting Office, uh, Government Accountability, it's called uh, these days, uh, and uh, uh, brilliant uh, economist, analyzed a lot of, of, of that uh, uh, data in those years and provided testimony to our committee before I engaged him to come on the committee. <laughs> but Frank, you ought to comment on, mm -hmm. on that. Well, we did find that plan. Hold, hold on, we're going to bring a, a microphone to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. We found that uh, fares were always higher at hub airports. Uh, we looked at all the hub airports around the country, including Cincinnati. In fact, what triggered it to begin with was the increase in fares after the Ozark acquisition in, in St. Louis. And we found that fares were much higher in, uh, in St. Louis following the acquisition of, of TWA by Ozark, uh, Ozark by TWA. And uh, the same thing was happening around the country, and we found that fares were always higher at, uh, at, the, con at the concentrated hubs. The power uh, that the airlines had, as Mr. Oberstar said, allowed them to charge higher fares. And it also allowed them, along with other things, to co uh, construct barriers to entry. And at the GAO, we identified eight barriers to entry that the more powerful legacy airlines were able to erect. 
Many of those have now since gone by the wayside. Uh, the airlines control the CRSs, for example. Uh, people today can book their flights online, no longer need to rely upon a travel agent. Uh, I had a question I was going to put to the group. Please, I, th I think we, we were, we're ready to move into the, that stage, so please, you'll be well, our first. One of the predicates of uh, deregulation was the fact that the airline industry was perfectly contestable, or at least largely contestable. And contestability simply means that there are very, very low barriers to entry. We found that there were, at the time, uh, 10 years later, significant barriers to entry, but many of those have since gone by the wayside. If indeed the airline market is relatively contestable, if not perfectly so, why haven't we seen more startup airlines or more of the smaller airlines begin entering these markets where fares are high, where margins are high? Is it because the overall economy in the U.S. and globally is down and that once the economies of the world and the United States improve, we will again see new entry? Is this a, is this a cyclical thing or is there a permanent uh, loss of service to these smaller communities. Phil, Phil, I think in in some ways you uh, dealt with that a little bit in your in your in your piece. Can you um, maybe bring uh, a historic perspective to the gentleman's question? In other words, w w were there not uh, 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 were there not startup railroads that were allowed in, and 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 uh, what happened there? Um. Well, yes. I mean, we, we <laughs> the first of our great bubbles, well, actually the second, first we had a canal bubble, then we had a railroad bubble, right, um, largely financed by naive uh, Europeans, right? Um, and it, uh, so the market got um, very enthusiastic about railroads and built them everywhere. And so we had an industry that um, couldn't earn its cost of capital either and ultimately um, required regulation in, in, to maintain its viability as a private enterprise. Um, so uh, I don't know if that's speaking to your question per se, but. Well, yeah, and that's and, and and I think in the example of railroads, what ultimately happened um, was uh, the ICC itself got captured by shippers and by um, um, to long, you know various politicians and members of the public who just wanted fast, frequent, cheap passenger rail service everywhere. So the industry. Um, and, and also we've suffered from micromanagement. Um, I think in trying to learn from the past, I mean, one of the things we want to avoid, I think, is this kind of um, judicial model that the ICC was. You know, the ICC, you know, used to, it was like a court, right? The commissioners wore robes, right? And people like Louis uh, uh, Brandeis would get up and argue cases, right? And uh, there, there came to be a, an ICC bar, right? And same thing happened with the Civil Aeronautics Board back in the day. It was this gigantic bar of, of people. And, you know, it was all public record, but it wasn't, it wasn't political enough, right? It, it, decisions came down to deeply technical questions. Um, that just allowed the people who had the most money f for legal counsel to, <laughs> to carry the day. And so, y yeah, I, I don't want to go back just to the old days, right? But I think bottom line is, you know, we created this ICC in, in, in eight, 1887, it became the de facto industrial policy of the United States. And we had to, that, that our government had to decide questions like, what should be the relative rates of shipping a, a hog versus a ham from Dubuque to Chicago, right? <laughs> and as it turned out, they had bunches of lawyers trying to figure that out. But, but we did it, right? And that became the de facto industrial policy of the United States. It was quite micro, right? And that was the era in which the United States emerged as the great industrial power, right? So I don't think that ultimately uh, 
this was some kind of prescription for failure. ICC got completely out of control in the 60s and 70s with the railroads, but like all human organizations, it was prone to corruption and decay. Can I ask Mr. Marks a question on following on Phil's a soliloquy, which uh, provoked a lot of thought. Uh, do you, uh, after what, what you have experienced in the airline industry, and, and what you're now doing in a sort of a think tank context, do you think the future of aviation is one of a very uh, small number, and, and if the American U.S. goes through, you have three mega global carriers worldwide, uh, and a handful of major hubs, and, 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 uh, and uh, regional service, as you called it, non-hub uh, uh, carriers that are servicing short-haul routes, those under two hours uh, time frame. Is, is that the future model? Do you, do you see that happening? I, I, in a nutshell, yes. Uh, and, and the reason I see that happening is that with the scale of the consolidated carrier, the number of, of American citizens who were covered by what I would call one-stop itineraries, a single hub connection, uh, has now exceeded, uh, I mean, certainly if you look at United Continental as a combined entity, it's, it's well over 95% of Americans in, in one form or another can get from point A to point B over the United Network in one stop. The, the, the other factor here, though, that plays into this is, is the viability of a startup airline. And having gone through that process, um, in the aftermath of ValueJet, uh, the process of certifying airlines fundamentally changed in the United States. Uh, we, we prioritize safety over, over economic viability at that point. So the, the price tag of starting a carrier and the time investment that was required uh, basically weaned out anybody who wasn't serious about doing it. And by serious, I mean anybody who didn't have $100 million or more financing, a new aircraft order or similar, a management team who knew what they were doing, uh, safety infrastructure to be safe coming out of the gate, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, good news is that the carriers that are certified today are safe, they're efficient, they're professionally managed, there's none of the fly-by-night uh, stuff that you used to see 20 years ago, and I would argue that's a good thing from the perspective of the American public. The bad news is that the, the prior models that we saw in the 1980s and early 90s of throwing something up against the wall and seeing if it sticks doesn't happen anymore. And, and that's, a, that's a policy choice that you know, even free market people like us would say is, is a good thing and that it, it, you know, there are certain safety and operational standards that the FAA does a very good job of holding people to. But it makes it incredibly difficult to start a new carrier. Uh, of, of the set that have been certified since the process changed, uh, JetBlue and Virgin America are the two that have, have made it. Uh, and both, I would argue today, are, you know, JetBlue had a period of success, but they're now marginally better than marginal, uh, but not exactly blowing the doors off. And Virgin America is still unproven in terms of whether they can survive over the long term. It, the amount of capital that's required to build an airline in the United States, you know, is, is certainly a nine-figure number now. It may be a ten-figure number uh, to make it happen. And I just don't see anybody in the financing community. I, I think airline investors are very intelligent. They're cyclical investors. Uh, contrary to some popular opinion, they actually know what they're doing. Um, they're not going to take the bet on that. So I do think that you end up, by default, therefore, in a world with, with a handful of aggressive, low-cost carriers with a highly unbundled product, an absolute low fare focus, uh, an unvarying uh, you know, push towards innovation and point-to-point -point air service. You may not like it, but you know, that's what the spirits and the allegiance and the frontiers are going to be a couple of years from now. Um, and the rest of the market, including Southwest uh, as a consolidated low fare entity, as well as the three major carriers that are likely to result out of this process, will offer the, the uh, less price sensitive consumer who cares about itinerary time the one stop connections from wherever you are to wherever you want to go in the world. I see that as the inevitable outcome. And, and, the, and the model that once existed, the economic model, that 10 percent of the uh, of the air travelers were business travelers, but they accounted for 50 percent of the revenues. Do you think that's the, uh, that model is changing? I, I, I do think that's changing, but I do think that that's a, a technological issue uh, in that the Internet, obviously the Internet fundamentally changed how airlines distribute mm -hmm. to customers because <coughs> where before you might have been restricted through, through CRS channels to nine or ten or, or ten you know, more fare buckets, uh, with relatively strict pricing levels so that there was a, uh, a very blunt pricing curve. Today, with the Internet, you can literally push a single price point to a single person if you want to. 
And that allows you to tailor the demand curve uh, a lot cleaner than you ever used to be able to. The internet is the reason why airlines run at much higher load factors today than they used to. You know, it's because you can sell that last seat very efficiently. You don't have to work through an indirect channel where you're blind. And as a result of that, I think that, that the differentiation, as we said, between, mm -hmm. between business and leisure pricing has deadened out a bit. The airlines have responded to that through unbundling um, in being able to, to drive lower price points to, to more price sensitive passengers. Um, but I, I do think that, that uh, you know, what the airlines continue to seek, as they should, as, as profit maximizing enterprises, are routes where they can dominate the traffic base, where they can dominate the schedule base, where they can dominate the, the corporate contracts that feed the business traffic on. Because ultimately, in the end, the markets where they can, they can have disproportionate service are the markets where they'll generate allegiance to the frequent flyer programs, uh, where they'll generate the, the corporate contracts who will pay whatever it takes in order to have the access to mm -hmm. the air transportation system. And that is how they're going to, going to sustain themselves from a profit perspective going forward. Tom, I, I want to make sure you can mm -hmm. weigh in on some of this if, you, if, you're, if you're interested. They're at a much, much deeper level than, uh, than I could get. Uh, the only thing that I would say is uh, in a city like ours, the frustration isn't just about the airfares. That's why it's so encouraging that you printed the article. It's the frustration that nobody seems to care and that we're just down there talking to ourselves. So this is uh, very exciting. The, the other thing that, that I want to uh, harken back to is that Midwestern cities, and in many respects, we're not a southern city, we're a Midwestern city, are struggling. And we're already pushing a boulder up a hill, and that hill just gets higher and higher when, we're not, when we have no connectivity in any reliable way to the uh, global economy. Yeah, it just, it just seems to me that, that, that we are on the uh, you know, very early stages of what is likely to be a pushback. I mean, Memphis may not have quite the population or the number of Fortune 500 com companies, but with St. Louis and Pittsburgh and, and uh, Minneapolis and some of the other cities, they do have votes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. They do have representation in Congress, and they are, you know, some of them are swing states. And at some point, uh, the, 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 the average person is gonna, voice is gonna be uh, put in here and, you know, w when you have inevitable concentration in an industry, what often follows is a whole heck of a lot of regulation of that consolidated industry. And it seems like y you can have a, a yeasty, competitive market of players in different, in, and, and, and no one can complain if, in the, in, 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 if there's a competitive market uh, that there may be some trade-offs. But if there's not competition, um, I don't know that forever the American public is going to accept dominant corporate players making decisions for their cities. Exactly, and on that point, government failed the public. I'm sorry, I would want to uh, uh, in, in, uh, override you, but I, government failed the public by not uh, intervening to prevent the consolidation of economic power in the airline sector in the years after deregulation, after the ex explosion of competition, contraction, and consolidation, and, uh, uh, and, and, and now global uh, consolidation. Can we get, uh, so can absent we a, absent a, a government uh, uh, disentangling of, of industry that is uh, uh, undoing the mergers, uh, should there be some government intervention in the marketplace to assure that there will be a regional airline service. That's a question uh, I'd like I, to hear. I'm going to try. We won't have a lot of time. I'm going to put three questions together. Lena, if you can just, folks, keep your questions nice and short, and we'll try to get some answers. Well, I'll make a, first I'll make a comment before my question about there probably is a correlation between those who want the government out of their hair and the location near a suffering formerly hub airport. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but anyhow, my question has to do more with what I find missing in this article is what kind of deregulation are we talking about? And the other questioner I think focused on one of them was uh, barriers to entry. And also what's come up is the cell phone network. You know, that doesn't have differentiation because you make a call from one place, you're bound to get to another place. Has anyone thought of that barrier of entry of going back to where tickets were interchangeable 
as a, a lowering a barrier of entry. And therefore, if you're going to be a regional carrier, you could automatically generate a ticket that would get you the same preferential rate on the long haul segment that anybody else could get. And therefore, you could sell that ticket, complete with frequent flyer points on that long haul section. I mean, that's the kind of deregulation that may get some attention uh, as opposed to a massive uh, judicial kind of uh, regulation. Okay. You know, that's a good well, point. We're going to try to. It would require some government intervention to do that. Uh, Frank, what do you think? What it would be interesting to see if the logic, uh, legacy airline would accept uh, that. I think they would start saying that. They're not going to accept anything to work. <laughs> 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 Sir, go ahead, what, please. What nobody seems to have mentioned here is that there's been no deregulation of airline management. And what I want to adjust is the question of the 75% requirement of U.S. ownership. Maybe we could get some of those naive Europeans to come in and operate to Memphis and to operate to Cincinnati. When you see the number of American airlines that have gone bankrupt in the past 10, 20 years, it is absolutely shocking. And you cannot blame that on deregulation. You have to blame an awful lot of that on very poor management. There is absolutely no question of that, and we ought to open it up. And, Mr. Chairman, I don't mean to say that we ought to let Lufthansa come in and operate here. I mean to say that if Lufthansa wants to do what Branson did, open up a U.S. corporation that is subject to U.S. law, labor law, tax law, everything else, just like operating just like a U.S. airline, let Lufthansa do that. Why should we protect management when we've protected no one else? Very good. Another uh, question. Uh in, in uh, this, this gentleman right here. We're going to get one more, and then we're then global airlines. That's really happening. <laughs> the one that the one group of people we haven't talked about yet is workers. I would hate to see how many jobs got lost from Memphis when Northwest pulled out. I'd hate to see how many jobs got lost from Duluth when Northwest pulled out. It's U.S. Air and Pittsburgh, so on and so forth. Let's talk about the impact on the workers in the industry as well. Okay, um, uh, lightning round of answers here, gentlemen. Who wants to start us off? Uh, Congressman, you were... Well, I, I would just comment on the, uh, on the <laughs> management. With the global carriers, do you really think that Richard Anderson is making all those decisions in Atlanta for Delta, that Air France, that KLM uh, are, are not uh, pushing uh, his elbow and making those choices? Uh, you know, that naive to think that in the, in the uh, uh, era of antitrust immunity airlines that all decisions are, are made in, in the U.S. Uh, the outright uh, ownership of U.S. Uh, uh, airlines uh, for management purposes that you rightly cited, uh, the, uh, uh, the, there are some questions that, that have to be resolved like uh, Civil Reserve Air Fleet uh, access and uh, uh, and, 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 and domestic uh, yeah those I'm just saying th those are issues that have to be be considered and and, and involved and the job losses uh, well that was uh, uh, you know any any one of the golden parachutes for the senior management in these uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions would have paid the cost of the layoffs. Uh, of the workforce, uh, there are huge amounts of, of money went to airline management for badly running an airline, selling it off, and, and getting out of the way for someone else to manage it. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to defend airline management here. Uh, <laughs> that's a losing cause. Um, but I, I will say that foreign ownership is, is up there in the most important issues the industry is facing. And it's not an issue necessarily of control, of, of allowing foreign carriers to control American carriers, but simply that the definition of, of foreign domicile is antiquated in respect to the global capital environment that we live in. And if we want to see investment by U.S. carriers in new markets, in new aircraft, in new maintenance facilities, uh, in any, any number of projects that require capital, we're going to have to recognize the fact that today's hedge funds are Cayman entities, are Bermudan entities, uh, that foreign investors like Lufthansa may have strategic interests in investing in non-control positions inside the United States. MaxJet uh, did go public. We were a foreign listed airline. Uh, this was uh, uh, groundbreaking for us in that we did a London Stock Exchange listing and we lived every day the pain and suffering of, of uh, how to reconcile 
foreign investment in the airline versus control issues. Uh, I do think it's a solvable problem, but I think that it's critical to think about that in the context of how to protect American jobs, how to protect viability of air service. It's not an issue of, of foreign carriers taking over U.S. carriers. It's a question of how to pool resources and, and knowledge in order to make the system more efficient. Folks, I want to thank you for coming today. Uh, today. Um, I, I feel like we, um, we're talking about things that, that simply aren't being talked about today in, in the news. You just won't find uh, these issues uh, being discussed yet. Uh, I do think we, just from what you heard today, th this is, um, these are issues that uh, two years from now, a year from now, five years from now are going to be on the, I think, on, a, on the front pages of the news. So uh, congratulations for being discerning enough to get here early on what is going to be an emerging conversation. I want to thank our panelists for um, thoughtful and penetrating and uh, informed uh, debate. And uh, thank Barry, uh, Lynn, for having the foresight to see this as an issue and putting this all together. And also uh, my team at the Washington Monthly, uh, Daniel Lutzer and uh, Ryan Cooper and uh, uh, Dan Strauss-Tucker and, and Carl Isley. Thank you, uh, New America. Uh, see you all soon.